Welcome to a special episode of the Afikra podcast. My name is Mikey Mahnam. Today on the series, we have Sara El Bulbasi, who completed her PhD at the Institute of Near and Middle East Studies at LMU Munich, Germany. We were recording this episode on Friday, October 27th at 4.41 uh, Palestine time. Sada, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Originally, I had told you that I wanted to speak to you about some of the research that you did for your dissertation relating to Palestinians in Germany. One, because it's, a, it's an interesting subject in and of itself, but two, also because of the insane blowback that we've been seeing in Europe against Palestinians and against people who have, who are displaying solidarity with the Palestinians, and, you know, waving the flag, and in particular Germany. But maybe we can start with a little bit of background on you. Why, you know, why are you, why you were interested in Germany and Palestine and the relationship between the two? I'm half Palestinian, half Swiss. I'm born to a Palestinian father and a Swiss mother. And I grew up in Switzerland and my, my dissertation was a hor oral history of Palestinians in Germany and Switzerland. I initially started to work on Palestinians in Switzerland because I wanted to work uh, about my own community. And then I got a job in Munich in Germany and basically extended my research to Germany. So it was, the, the dissertation was about how Palestinians how the tabooization and the criminalization of Palestinianness and of Palestinian history, of Palestinian identity, how this influenced Palestinians living in, in Germany and Switzerland. It was, it was actually about what we are seeing now as well. I mean, and... Yeah, I can't imagine how hard it must be for you to watch not only the insane you know, genocidal images coming out of Palestine, but also the stories coming out of Europe. I mean, I can't imagine how that makes you feel. Yeah, the stories, I mean, you, you can't really separate the, the diaspora histories or stories from the, from, from the stories of Palestinians on the ground in Palestine. And in many ways, diaspora Palestinians remain mentally in Palestine and connected to what happens in Palestine and actually wanted to show how the physical erasure Palestinian experience in, in historical Palestine is repeated on a discursive level, on a symbolic level in the diaspora. So I tried to, to show the continuation of this um, systemic violence that Palestinian experience in historical Palestine in, in the diaspora in Europe. And in Germany specifically. Can you help me understand that idea? Like, historically, what does that actually look like? And what has it looked like for people over the last, you know, are you talking about 100 years? Or help me understand some of what you mean. So basically three, three waves of migration, three big waves of migration to Europe or to Germany. First of all, Germany has the Palestinians in Germany are the largest Palestinian community in Europe. There are about um, 200,000 Palestinians living in Germany. It's the largest Palestinian community in Europe, but it's all also the most silent community in, in Europe. And this silence is the result of the of this tabuization and of the criminalization of Palestinianness. And we have three waves of migration. There is the study and the work migration from the 1960s. And there is the refugee migration of Palestinians from the Lebanese war in the 1980s. And the third wave of migration was were Palestinians from the Syrian refugee camps after 2011. And I tried to, like what I was interested in was how, not only in how this symbolic erasure of Palestinianness in the diaspora not only influenced first generation Palestinians, meaning Palestinians who migrated to Europe, but also Palestinians born in Europe. So the children of those Palestinians who came to Europe to study and to work and Palestinians uh, who fled to Europe. 
My father one, was one of those who came in the 1960s to, to Germany and then to Switzerland. He was one of those who went to Germany to study. He had, like, like many of his generation, had the vision to live to, to, to return to Palestine and to establish, to, to free Palestine and to, to build a new Palestinian society. And like many of his generation, he got stuck in the diaspora because after 67 with the occupation, Palestinians who were not at home at the time, meaning not in, in, in the West Bank, Gaza, were not allowed to return. So he, well, he was one of those who experienced a sort of indirect expulsion at a moment where he tried to, where he had this vision and this dream to liberate Palestine. And he has remained in exile in Germany first and then in Switzerland. Many Palestinians in Germany in 1972, at the time of the, of the hostage taking in Munich, were basically expelled because there was another sort of collective punishment. So basically Palestinians in Germany were punished for, for the hostage taking and had to leave the country. Yeah. German, German citizens, were they at, at this point, regardless of citizenship, were they collectively punished in the same way? Regardless of citizenship, regardless of if they uh, were married to to German women, if they had families in Germany. Yeah. Over the course of your life, do you feel like the amount of discrimination, outright hatred has changed? Has it increased, decreased, stayed exactly the same? The amount of hatred? I feel like I'm not sure how to respond to this question or how you want to measure hatred. Yeah. I feel like, I feel didn't change. It just, it, it didn't change its nature. It changed more its face. It's much more obvious, much more visible now. Yeah, maybe we could say that what we see now, I guess you also saw the pictures of police violence in Berlin, like the pictures of Palestinians or people who are in solidarity with Palestinians are dragged to the ground, are being handcuffed, are being detained for hours. I guess you know about the bans on gatherings, not just of protests in solidarity with Palestine and for human rights in Palestine, but also the bans on gathering at the time of the Nakba commemorations we had in 2022 and also in 2023. People were not allowed to collectively mourn about the Nakba in public space. They were not allowed to to hold minutes of silence in comm commemoration of the Nak. I mean, I think this sort of violence was always there. It was maybe more subtle, yeah. But at the same time, I feel like this violence always increased always when the brutality um, of the Israeli state increased in historical Palestine. So maybe mm. it's not a linear, we don't have to conceive of it as a linear increase of hatred. I think we more have to see it as, a, as an increase of hatred in parallel with the increase of hatred in historical Palestine. Like the more brutally the Israeli state acts against Palestinians in historical Palestine, the more violent becomes the discourse in Germany and the more vile, the more, yeah. the bigger becomes the hatred towards Palestinians in Germany. In a perverse and sick way that I understand the logic and, or the mechanism and how they're connected. You've written about this idea of the politics of visibility and Palestinians' visibility in Germany and, you know, in Central Europe and Switzerland. Can you give me a sense or can you try to explain how that level of visibility has changed over time across these generations? The first generations of Palestinians often denied themselves and there was much shame and much guilt they felt in regard to their own Palestinianness. And it was an identification with the 
violence experienced in the diaspora. And I, I, with politics of visibility, I tried to describe how this changed with the second generations of Palestinians born in Germany, how they, and this is a transformation we, we, we can witness now, we can experience now. And it's also transformation that I was trying to observe with myself. And, and I wouldn't say it's something with, which already has ended. It's, it's a conflict we experience in, within ourselves. 2014, when we experienced the last massacre in Gaza, I, I felt like there was a sort of turning point for many Palestinians. At the time I was in Berlin and I tried to, I tried to, in an autoethnographic way, I tried to describe what, what we experienced at the time. And I discovered a sort of pattern. Many Palestinians, many second generation second generation Palestinians at the time said, we cannot remain in this invisibility anymore. We want to show ourselves. We want to show our faces and our names because before it was often that you, if you would sign a petition, you would, you would sign it anonymously or your parents would have told you, don't tell where you're from, tell rather you had a Jordanian passport, then you would maybe say you're a Jordanian. In 2014, there was such a shock, like very similar to what we see now. Of course, we cannot compare, but there, there was such a shock that many just couldn't, like many Palestinians felt as if they were in, in historical Palestine because they felt the violence physically, like many told me they couldn't, they couldn't breathe anymore. They felt like in a prison. So this shock was so, this shock in regard to what happened in Palestine, but also the shock of how they were treated from the society that they were born in and where they had grown up. This shock was so, so, so unbearable that they actually broke with this the self-denial which was often imposed to them from their parents and of course from the society they lived in so they tried to like they, t they tried to write about it. they tried to make films about it they, yeah then it is a conflict like it's not always easy to break with the self-denial with invisibility there is still much fear and People with a citizenship, with a German citizenship, of course, um, maybe dare to do more than Palestinians who don't have a citizenship. But still, with Palestinian with the like the the fear of social deaths and also exclusion, the fear also to to lose social connections, the fear of maybe you would have to give up a friend if you would show yourself, show who you are. This makes it also, all of this makes it also difficult for Palestinians with a citizenship. Yeah, I mean, these are real fears. These are, they're not imagined. I mean, loss of relationships, livelihood, connections, social connections, and access to specific communities. This is all real. I mean... And it's something that I think it's hard for people to understand unless they, unless they live it. Do you feel like you're ostracized from the rest of your colleagues? Do people understand, you know, like w what you're going through and the people that you work with? Do they have a sense? I feel it's more the, the people of an Arabic background. These are the people usually I can share with. I feel like a lot of friendships I had with people who doesn't understand these feelings are already broke. You know, I don't have, I mean, I don't have many, I guess I don't have friends anymore who don't sympathize with Palestinians. I remember a friend told me now in Berlin that she's surprised how many people don't understand her. And I was surprised that she still had that she still has so many friends who, who don't sympathize with her because it's very difficult to, to bear this hostility in a very intimate setting. Yeah. Yeah. Especially when they don't understand it as active hostility, 
right? If they um, think like, why are you making this such a big deal? Yeah, this trivialization and this penalization. Yeah. Is it only from the right wing in Germany, this type of hostility or trivialization? I know, I would say it's structural. I mean, I mean, it's a sort of structural racism. I always thought, thought it had to do with, uh, with the historical guilt and that it was, that this guilt was somehow repressed and then projected on the Palestinians. But with the time, I, I had to be honest to myself and I had to see that I, this was somehow an apology. Like to say that this hostility is a result of the repression of guilt is just a, a way of apologizing, a way of making people victims of their own guilt. And I had to acknowledge that it's very, it's very simple, actually. It's just sort of structural racism, which denies Palestinians the, their humanity. And yeah. And this is not, I mean, this is not a racism. You just can, yeah, it would be a nice thing. It would be a very nice thing to just situate this hostility with the right or far right. It's a very, it's a very polite, very subtle hostility. I mean, I just, a few minutes before we talked today, there was a journalist calling me from a Swiss newspaper from one of the big, from of the most renowned Swiss newspapers and he wanted to interview people with family in Gaza and my family is in Gaza. I asked him to describe what my statements would be used for and what the context would be for my statements and he said that he's planning to do also to go to Jewish schools and to do interviews with um, Jewish people and to see how they are affected by by the conflict yeah he was a very polite young guy you know probably um leftist probably i don't know i would like him when i when i saw him in a in his politeness was something very cruel you know in the way he wanted to give to to give voice to the both sides you know the way he wanted to yeah. show the suffering of both sides you know and I saw the cruelty, not just in what he was planning to do, also the cruelty in his voice, the politeness and the correctness, which I heard in his voice. For me, I would have maybe apologized a few years ago. I would have maybe said to myself, yeah, maybe he doesn't know I'm not able to do it anymore. Yeah, you don't make excuses for them anymore. Can I ask you this, you know, about, I've seen in your work, this idea of like the taboo of the Nakba. It's, it's an idea that I, I had never really thought about. And so I'm curious, like, A, what that, what you're really getting to, uh, what you're talking about in the context of Europe and how that event and that ethnic cleansing is thought about in Europe. There is not only a taboo of the Nakba, it's also moral justification. Like on one side, you, like often I was told that, or I had to hear that there was not such a thing as the Palestinian people. This was at Golda Meir's, right? I mean, a people, what did she used to say? A country without people, for people without country. I'm sure you know this yeah, statement. So. Taboo of the Nakba means, I'm, I'm saying this, if there was no, if there was no people like the Palestinians, the crime also doesn't exist. Taboo of the Nakba is a sort of, I mean, I mean with it that the crime itself, the expulsions itself were denied. I mean, we don't learn them in, in, in the school books in Europe, even though the Nakba is a direct consequence of the Shoah of National Socialism. These two historical events, there is a very selective remembering and forgetting about them. The Nakba couldn't have happened because the Palestinians didn't exist. And if it happened, then the Palestinians, it was the fault of the Palestinians or the Palestinians um, sold their 
own lands or they happened as a sort of side effect of the Arab-Israeli war or Palestinians were not attached to their country and therefore left it voluntarily or didn't experience the leaving of their country as an expulsion. These were all narratives I frame as not just the tabuization of the Nakba, also tab tabuization of Palestinianness, because these two things are connected to each other. If there is no Palestinians, there is no crime. And moral justification is, I often use the word symbolic violence, because with symbolic violence, I mean the, the whole legitimation about the systemic violence that Palestinians are experiencing. And moral justification is, besides tabuization, a strong instrument, a strong tool to sort of conceal this violence. And there we have this one discursive pattern is this perpetrator-victim dichotomy, which always takes on new discursive figures, sometimes the Palestinian terrorists, Palestinian anti-Semites, sometimes the Palestinian Islamists, but it's always a sort of violent, demonized, evil collective figure who is a sort of eternal perpetrator. And, and the Jewish collective figure is the eternal victim, yeah. And in this dichotomy, there is no, there is also no resistance anymore because you cannot, I mean, if you try to resist this eternal victim, this resistance becomes always perpetratorship. Um, yeah. Sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah. Do you feel like the average, like well-meaning German, right? Like, let's go back to this guy, this polite guy you see at the bar, right? Yeah. Do you feel like generally they're, they believe that this was a land without a people cynically or do you think they actually believe that is it misinformation or is it like just like deep racism and white supremacy or i mean why do they believe this there's so much in it. i mean how could they possibly still believe this i mean that's a question i ask myself almost daily i mean even people who are older right even people you who are able to see what's going on since the kids who are able to observe what's going on since the the Kates are still very loyal to Israel and not sympathizing with Palestinians. I don't think it's ignorance or the lack of information. We used to think, Palestinians in the diaspora used to think, used to wish that this was ignorance or lack of information till 2014. And then we somehow, something happened. I think it was just wishful thinking because it's much easier to bear this hatred and this hostility when you say, oh, the guy at the bar, he just doesn't know. It's much more difficult to bear the mere cruelty that comes with seeing that, no, he doesn't want to know. Yeah. He doesn't want to know and he doesn't, actually care. But maybe another thing which is, which doesn't have to do with racism is cowardness. I think cowardness is many times another reason why people don't stand with Palestine. Also difficult to be this, like to be on the right side, you know, the wish yeah, to be. A to do the right thing and to be correct and this kind of conformism. Yeah. Sara, I know that you have family in Palestine. And so I, I, I can't imagine how tough it is for you right now. I'm so grateful that you were able to share some of this with us. It's a, it's an impossibly dark and hard time. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so much.